Well, thank you, and happy Father's Day to uh, all those uh, fathers that are here with us this morning. If you were here early, and most of this crowd was not here early, I'm assuming, uh, that is, you came in and you had uh, the opportunity to have uh, a donut with Dad. But we had that from 8 to 8.45, and so people were in there uh, eating away and, and chowing down on all those great calories. And so that's, uh, that's a good thing, great way to start your day, um, without a doubt, right? Uh, donuts, there's just something about donuts, cookies, cakes, that just kind of gets me. Um, this morning, I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball, because we're in our study in the book of Mark called Following the Master, but I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7. So there's your curveball uh, this morning. We're in Luke chapter 7, but we're in a series in Mark. How is that possible, you say? Well, as we noticed last Sunday, when we were talking about Luke chapter 7, and we refer to the fact that the Pharisees and the scribes were just irate over Jesus' willingness to call Matthew the tax collector, dreaded tax collector, uh, to come and be a disciple of his. We pointed out the fact in verse 35 that the scripture there says that uh, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. That is, there would be a uh, testimony change in a believer who's truly a follower of Jesus Christ. As you look at this passage here in Luke chapter 7, uh, we're going to come to uh, following verse 35, verse 36 through 50. But before uh, we get into the message this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read uh, God's word together here, starting in verse 40. So if you'd stand up in honor of God's word, I'd like to read for you verse 40 on down to the end of the chapter. And Jesus answered him, Simon... Simon's the Pharisee, of course. He says, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher, actually rabbi. A money lenderer had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave, he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would bless the word of God to our hearts and minds this morning, how we pray, Lord, that the meaning of this passage would be something that we would understand, and that the lessons of it, Father, would truly challenge our hearts and minds today. We thank you, Father, for your precious word. May it be a blessing to us today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. I want to take the opportunity to introduce to you uh, the characters of our text that we're going to be uh, looking at this morning. We find here in this passage of scripture, beginning in verse 36, that uh, there are going to be two different characters in addition to Jesus who are very, very different in many ways. We have on the one hand a man by the name of Simon. He's a Pharisee. And then we have a woman who is, in the view of society and in the view of God, a very uh, wicked person, perhaps, a sinner of sorts. These are different people, but they are more in common than you might think as you first look at them. But I'd like to introduce to you first this man, Simon. In verse 36, it says, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. We have here in this passage of Scripture the opportunity to see a, a, a picture of what it would look like to be invited into someone's home. 
Uh, Jesus is invited into Simon the Pharisee's home. The Pharisee's home would be a, a home that would basically be square in shape. At least it would have in the center of it an open courtyard. And inside of that open courtyard, this is where they would put the food and people would recline at the table. And it's important for us to have a mental image of this because as the story unfolds, we're going to find that uh, something dramatic is going to happen here as they're sitting down to eat. Maybe this is a more modern picture of what uh, it was like to sit down and eat. I am so thankful when I look at these pictures that we have tables to sit at with real chairs. Can I just say that? I mean, I can hardly eat now without getting food on me. I mean, would it be ridiculous to sit there and try to eat like that? And uh, can you imagine a bowl of spaghetti in the front of these fellows with the white shirts, no less, right? It would be disaster. Well, maybe in a more relative way, understanding what Jesus' day it might have looked like, uh, here those are seated at the front of the table, the head of the table, and the guests are all around it. And it's just raised up a little bit, and they would spread the food out there, and people would be able to partake of the meal. But you'll notice there that they're reclining, and their head is over by the table while their feet, is, uh, their feet are sticking out uh, into the courtyard area. Well, here is uh, this man, and we don't know that much about him, but as you'll see in the handout, I'm calling him the self-righteous Pharisee. He's the self-righteous Pharisee, and you say, well, Pastor Kevin, why are you calling him self-righteous? I call him self-righteous because he makes this statement in verse 39, where he says, if this man, speaking about Jesus, were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him that she's a sinner. Uh, for Simon's perspective, he was looking at this woman and he was understanding that she was a very wicked person and she was, without a doubt, a tremendous sinner. But when he considered himself, he did not consider himself in such a way. He looked at his own life and thought to himself, well, I must be okay. There are certain people that are designated as wicked and those who are designated as sinners, but of course it wasn't him. So here as the story unfolds, there's a question to ask. Why did Simon invite Jesus to his home in the first place? Why would he do such a thing? What was the impetus behind it? Well, I would suggest to you that there could be as many as three reasons why he invites Jesus to come. I think the first one that we could ask ourselves is, was he an admirer? Did he admire Jesus? And we would understand and know that he's really not an admirer of Jesus because of the, as the text is going to go on, the portion that we just got through reading, we're going to find out that he didn't even do the things that a normal host would do for his guest. And so it's very easy to disprove any notion that he's an admirer. The second possibility is he was just looking to trip Jesus up in something Jesus, he, Jesus would say or do. Uh, he could go back to the Sanhedrin and maybe with some juicy tidbit uh, to tell them, this is what I discovered about Jesus, or you're not going to believe what Jesus had to say or did. Well, that could be the case, but probably not. Probably better to understand that he was most likely a collector of celebrities. He was patronizing Jesus. It was great to be able to have this young Galilean over for dinner and to be able to tell all your friends that this one who is out there healing people and doing all these amazing miracles was actually at my house and he was, he was you know, it's almost like George Washington slept here. It's like, oh, he is a celebrity. Now, how many of you have met a celebrity? Yeah, and I could get into it and start asking questions and find out who you met it's really cool. Now, Now, how many of you that had your hand up that you met a celebrity, now the celebrity would actually know you? Anybody? All right, there's one. Well, that's great. Um, I remember meeting Red Skelton once, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> You meet a celebrity, and it's like kind of like you got bragging rights, right? I mean, you know, and if old Red was here, which I'm glad he's not, because um, he's passed away. Um, 
uh, you know, old Red would, would say, I don't remember meeting this guy. I mean, he was only 19 at the time, right? So, so when you look at this motivation, it's important to note why Simon is seeking out Jesus. I don't see that there's any indication whatsoever that he was really interested in what Jesus is teaching uh, and finding out what the truth truly is. Uh, but nonetheless, he's invited Jesus into his home. The second character that comes into our story here in the verse following, it says, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, uh, she came and she's going to bring with her uh, an alabaster vial of perfume. Now, it's fascinating, back in those days, uh, when someone was having a big dinner party, uh, you could actually walk right into the open area inside of the home. And that's why when Peter's uh, uh, home there along the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, Jesus is uh, healing people, and the people are just coming from all over the place. And what it would look like is if you were this woman, you could come into that open area, that courtyard, and you could stay in the shadows and and listen to what the teacher was saying. It was wholly appropriate to do that. It was wholly appropriate for Simon to ask a visiting preacher or teacher, a rabbi as it were, to come and speak to a group at a dinner party. That was normative in the day. And if I wanted to go and hear what this rabbi had to say, I could just walk right into your home. There was nobody there asking for identification. Do you know what I mean? You could walk right in. Now, she didn't have an invitation to recline at the table. She had no no wherewithal to be able to see that happen at all. She could just stay in the shadows, so to speak, and listen with her hearing to the teacher's uh, word that he had at that dinner party. But she comes in, and the picture of this is amazing because she comes in, and the Bible says she heard that Jesus was reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, And she brings in an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, this is when he says, if this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of sinner she was. This woman comes in and she's very, very different from Simon. Now, both Simon and the women, woman of the, of the story are both sinners. Would we agree on that? They're both sinners, and they both have spiritual needs. But she comes in, and she begins to weep. You see, within society, she was known as a prostitute, as best we can understand. And that's why when Jesus will say to her, and your sins, which are many, are forgiven, she was well known in town. Just like Matthew was well-known and despised, so she was also rejected by society. Here she is, a prostitute. I wonder how many women would talk to such a woman like this. She was public enemy number one, wouldn't she be? She was despised by people. And yet here she is, and, and stop and think about the women, but also the men. No one would be speaking to her. She would be an outcast of society. And yet she comes in, and she is so burdened by her sin, she recognizes that the only relief from her sin is if she would have the Savior forgive her sin. She is very, very aware of her own personal wickedness. She totally gets it. She totally understands the significance of her sin. You see, she is a sinner. It's true. So also was Simon, but he didn't see it. You and I live in a day and age where things that used to be considered wicked and sinful are being passed over as such. People today don't see their need for a savior so often because they don't recognize themselves as sinners. Things that used to be sinful are no longer sinful. Have you ever felt like we're kind of on an avalanche of sorts, morality-wise? You see, the public opinion of what is moral and what is immoral has changed dramatically for us in our society today. 
the Gallup poll people, not to be confused with the Christian organization Barna, but the Gallup poll people did a poll back in 2001 in which they took 20 areas of morality and they asked questions, simple questions about each one. In 2018, earlier this year, they did another study. And what they found was that homosexuality, premarital sex, divorce, marijuana, pornography are being approved by a growing percentage of Americans. They found that there were some enormous trends that were taking place. Someone went on to say, our American culture has lost its moral and ethical roots. We're no longer Judeo-Christian. And someone I'm quoting says, unfortunately, many Christians are becoming more like the world than previous generations of Christians who were set apart by godly lifestyles were. And that's pretty accurate, isn't it? I want you to pay attention to a couple of these statistics that I just want to share with you this morning. Uh, because different things are happening. And when you look over the change, you can see the trajectory uh, that things are, are moving according to. 67% approve of homosexuality today compared to 40% in 2001. Hmm. That's a pretty big shift, isn't it? It's 37%. 69% approve of premarital sex compared to 53% in 2001. 76% of Americans say divorce is morally acceptable compared to 59% in 2001. 65% of Americans approve of childbirth outside of marriage compared to 45% in 2002 when Gallup added the practice to its poll. While a majority of Americans... 55% to be exact, oppose pornography, the 43% who say it's morally acceptable has increased from the 30% who approved of it in 2011 when they added it to their poll. Did you catch that? 43% say it's morally acceptable, that is, pornography is morally acceptable, and only seven years ago, 30% said they approved of it. You see, what you're seeing is a real change. Does it seem like that to you as you watch television or as you read newspapers or you hear people talking, as you see what's acceptable in the public square? Does it seem like it's changing? Now, here's a, here's a crazy fact. I was just thinking the other day, my kids are 35 and 33 years old. And if you go back to 2002... Okay, that's 16 years ago. They were like 20 years old. In their lifetime, morality has changed in our society. In their lifetime, let alone Kevin's lifetime. It is amazing how things are shifting. Back to our text. Here's a woman who comes and she falls to the feet of Jesus, basically, uh, and she is weeping over her sinfulness. She understands her wickedness. She understands her need for a savior. And the rest of the people there are very, very pious and they don't see the need. My friends, listen, morality in a situation like a culture like ours can change, but God's word doesn't change. And it is the standard. It is the true north as we sang about earlier in our service. It is the true north and that needle never moves. Remember those uh, old shows when, I'm thinking definitely black and white here, where there's a lady and she's very prim and proper, and somebody does something that was like wrong or whatever, and she goes, <gasps> you remember those moments? Well, here's the interesting thing. Look at your text there, because what you see is with this woman crying and the, and the tears literally flowing off of her face, they're wetting the feet of Jesus. She has no towel and she removes the whatever it was that was holding her hair up and her hair falls down and she uses her hair to wipe up the feet of Jesus. That is a <gasps> moment. Because when a woman was married, she put her hair up for the wedding, and never in the sight of the public did she ever let her hair down. There was no occasion that she would ever let her hair down that someone else could see. 
And here you have this huge room full of people, and this woman is so overwhelmed by her sinfulness and her desire to be pleasing to Jesus that she lets down her hair. You talk about having one of those moments. What was she thinking? That's exactly what she does because she's overwhelmed by her sin. She's not even thinking culturally at all or what is going on in her day. She is overwhelmed by her sin. And she responds as only she can respond. Here's where the application comes to bear. For Jesus is going to ask a question of Simon, verse 40. And he asks this question and he he puts out the hypothetical. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. 500 denarii is a lot of denarii, all right? You would work for, get this, you would work one and a half years to make that much denarii. Then the other one owes 50. They owe 50. You say, well, 50, 50 is nothing. I mean, what's 50? I mean, 50 bucks or whatever. It's actually two months of working. I remember when I was a kid and I was working, I was making like two bucks an hour, buck 70 to be exact. I just got a raise. And I remember thinking how long you had to work in order to get paid. You know what I mean? And everything all of a sudden, you know, it's like you're going to go buy a candy bar and it's like 50 cents. You're thinking, i got to work 30 minutes for that, right? And you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Here's this woman who has come and she's going to anoint Jesus' feet with this alabaster perfume. That's actually going to be a long period of time. That is like six, uh, it's actually a year's worth of wages that she's going to anoint Jesus' feet with. So here's the scenario. Somebody owes 50 denarii. Somebody else owes 500 denarii. And the question that Jesus presents is, all right, when they were unable to repay it, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? It's a great question, isn't it? Who's going to love Jesus more? And he asked Simon this question. Now, there's a key point here that you don't want to miss. They were different in what they owed, but verse 42 says that they were both unable to repay it. Neither one of them could pay it. It it didn't matter if you owed 50 or you owed 500. You were still in debt. And back in Jesus' day, you can read some of the other gospel accounts, but there are times when it talks about, uh, you know, throwing somebody in debtor's prison. And 50 denarii would get you there, all right? You can't blow it off and say it really doesn't matter. And so Jesus' question to Simon is, well, who is going to be the one who loves you more. And understand that the word uh, for love you more in the Hebrew and uh, Aramaic that Jesus is speaking here, um, there's no terminology to show gratitude or be thankful. And so when it is translated here in our Bibles as love you more, what he's basically saying, it should be paraphrased uh, more accurately, be grateful and thankful. Which one of these two people is going to be more thankful? And Simon says, well, I guess it's the one who has been forgiven a greater debt. Jesus said, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And he looked at him. And he made the following observation. He says, do you see that woman? It's like, of course you see the woman. Everybody sees the woman. I mean, she is like stealing the show here, right? He says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. You gave me no kiss. And you didn't anoint my head with oil. When a guest entered a home in Jesus' time, it was appropriate that three things were always done. The first thing that happened when you walked into that host's home is the host would come place his hand on your shoulder and give you a kiss of peace. That was the first thing. And because the roads were just dirt tracks and you only had 
a sole wrapped up with some leather bands. Your feet were dirty and lousy and they hurt half the time. And you would come in and the host would have a water container there and he would wash your feet. He would rinse them off, make them cool again, clean them up as you would come into your home. Can you imagine all those people sitting around that, that table there as they're reclining and those, those, those feet are sticking out and they're all stinky feet? I mean, that'd be great, right? Why, why right where you're trying to eat? And then they would take a little drop of some oil and they would anoint your head. Those three things were done commonly in Jesus' day. And Jesus points out the fact that, you know, Simon, and this is why we know Simon's not an admirer of Jesus. You know, Simon, I came into your home and you didn't do any of those things for me. You did none of it. And yet here she is. You wouldn't wash my feet, and yet her tears have been poured out. You, you should have been there with a towel and some water, and she didn't have a towel. Yeah, she used her hair, and you think it's all terrible. But you know what? You didn't do anything. She took a year's worth of wages, and she anointed my feet with that. You see, the question is this morning, where is the gratefulness for our salvation. I've been saved a long time, I guess, over 50 years. But the one thing that really stands out in my mind is I've, I've watched churches. The one thing that stands out in my mind is, is why people aren't more thankful in the church. I just don't get it. I just really never have. And, and I know, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know if I owed 5,000 denarii or if I owed 50. I was saved at the age of seven years old, but I'll tell you what, the longer I've been a Christian, the more I realize what God's done for me. We, we live in a time where, where the church has grown very, very cold. There, there's so much pride in the church today, and I've always noticed this, and I've always thought to myself, why in the world should we be proud of anything? It is according to his mercy that he saved us, is it not? Here this woman is, and she is overwhelmed by the forgiveness of Christ, and she is giving everything to Jesus. And yet we as a church, and I say this about churches everywhere, we, we kind of, you know, well, God, you know, I got good news for you on Sunday. I don't have anything else going on. I'm going to church. Really? Yahoo. Where's the passion? Where's the joy? Where's the thankfulness that you and I should have for the Savior? There should be nothing that motivates us more than our joy for Christ. Our absolute over-the-top desire to please him. It should be the overwhelming desire of our heart and life, should it not? Whether you owed 50 or whether you owed 5,000 really or 500 didn't matter. What matters is you cannot pay any of it back. And because of that, the money lenderer in the story that Jesus told graciously forgave both of those debtors. You see, Simon didn't think there was anything wrong. Didn't see any need in his life. Thought he was doing just fine. If you were really a prophet, Jesus, you'd know that this lady was a sinner. My friends, listen, Jesus knew that both of them were sinners. And Jesus knows that you and I are sinners. And that is why Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross. To pay the penalty of your sin. He has done that. And now we can come to him through faith and be saved. You say, what about that terminology? Isn't that kind of old-fashioned? I want you to see there that when Jesus says your sins have been forgiven, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. My friends, faith is the only thing that will bring salvation, but the realization of our need is key. I go back to verse 35 here in our text. In verse 35, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. This woman is going to go in peace. She has made peace with God through faith in Christ. And her sins have been forgiven. Jesus is very clear in pointing that out. 
But you know, it's easy, isn't it? That's what Jesus said. What's easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to heal the paralytic? What's, what, what, what is so easy about saying your sins are forgiven? It's easy to say that, isn't it? But here's where the power comes in. And I draw back to verse 35, which is kind of in the center and connects both of these passages of Scripture here in Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, verse 35, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. I don't believe for a moment that Matthew went back into tax collecting. He started ripping off people all over again. Do you believe that? I believe that when Jesus called him, he left that all behind. And I believe that this woman, if she was a harlot, she was leaving it all behind. And you would see then the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it changes these people who in the sight of the society at large were overwhelmingly wicked people. There was an ethic back in those days. They recognized that, and when you saw the change in people's lives, it was undeniable that the power of the transforming gospel of Jesus Christ was at work, and it vindicated all of the divine wisdom of this is how God is going to change hearts. God, in his wisdom, knew exactly what he was doing. And God changes lives back then, and he continues to change lives today. It's a testimony of a man who, whose name is Scott Thorson. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, to a loving mother, mother and father. And he says, our family grew in the addition of my brother and an adopted sister by the name of Tina. He said, I had a caring family, but I often felt misplaced because my dad was closer to my baby brother and never showed me any affection. I lacked any social life, had no real friends, and was bullied on almost a daily basis. I was never done any harm by my parents, but I do remember my dad violently beating and raping my mother. I became withdrawn, and the bullying I suffered ultimately led my parents to place me in a facility for emotionally disturbed children at the age of 12. My mom then filed for divorce and a protection order. My dad was allowed to visit the house for two hours a day to run his business. It was suggested to my mom that w- from one of my doctors that I be told that the monster that beat and raped her and the man who was incapable of showing me love was not my real father. My mom contacted my real father in California, and we met a week later. He told me how much he missed me and how he regretted giving me away. He showed me the affection I had been longing for my entire life, and we made plans to see each other the following week. The next week came, and I saw my dad was crying uncontrollably. He held me and told me that my stepfather came home, murdered my mother, shot my sister, and then turned the gun on himself. My doctors felt like the move to California would be too much too soon, so they sent me to another mental hospital and then to another one. Once I got to California, I became withdrawn and quiet and emotional wreck. I didn't fit in. I started doing drugs, drinking, fighting, isolating myself. I was heavy into punk rock and pierced my face with safety pins and spiked my jet black hair as mile high. He says, my drug use escalated. One day, my younger brother accidentally drank a soda I put some LSD into, and that was it. Dad had enough. He took the money I'd inherited, placed me into a long-term drug treatment program, and I spent a year there. And while I was there, I cut off the jet black hair, removed the earrings, took off the makeup, hit the gym hard, and lifted weights every day. My body transformed. I entered that program, 120-pound skinny kid. And when I left, I was a 165-pound monster of a teenager. I started my freshman year of high school, and he says, I had new friends, was suddenly noticed and desired by girls. While in high school, I started taking kickboxing classes, and I loved it. I went to the gym every day, fought whenever I could. Within six months, I became the amateur California State kickboxing champion. During one of my fights, I was noticed by the producer of Baywatch, and they asked me to be on their show. The short-lived fame really went to my head, and my ego exploded. Shortly after filming, I met my first wife, Lisa. We married, had two beautiful daughters, doing fairly well. But he says, my ego was out of control. I was self-centered, and I cheated on my wife every chance I got. Ultimately, after years of unfaithfulness, she left me. And when this happened, then I loved her, then I needed her. I begged her not to leave. All my childhood hurt resurfaced, and I experienced the empty. Uh, emptiness of losing my mother and being abandoned all over again. I lost my mind, began using drugs again. I took the coward's way out. I drove uh, out to Oregon, took a job as a bartender in a strip club. It was there that I was introduced to the needle. And the second I felt the drugs in my, in my heart, he says, in that moment, it was like Satan wrapped his arms around me, almost as if he was embracing me, saying, I have you now. You belong to me. 
Spent the next four years of my life homeless. I robbed people, became a thief, and did unspeakable things to get drugs. I was lost, broken, and at my bottom. I had overdosed several times, and only by the grace of God survived. One day, while on my way to a shooting gallery, a pastor stopped me and gave me a track uh, that had um, uh, some candy uh, wrapped around it. But he said, I wasn't interested. He said later, he said, um, he actually... uh, joined the Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was clean for seven years. And during that time, he got a great job uh, working for a roofing company, and uh, he met his new wife, Charlene, uh, while attending a meeting. And everything was going along fine, he thought. He said, I I gave her everything. I thought she wanted money, cars, beautiful home. What she really wanted was me to be at home. After all that time, after unsuccessful pleas for me to quit my job, find one closer to home, and a traumatic miscarriage, she felt the pain was too great, and she left him. He said, that hole I felt my entire life came back, and the void got bigger and bigger. I thought I'd done everything right this time. I loved her with every ounce of me. I was faithful, provided her with everything she could want. And he said, I put the needle back in my arm to kill the pain. My wife and I went through a very ugly public separation. And he says, uh, the relapse was short-lived. And I found myself, he says, crying out to God and asking God to help him. Well, she agreed to have a a, a new start in the relationship. And he says, I drove straight to where she was living and began to talk. My wife agreed to let me take her on a date. And that night, he said, God showed up. On that first date, as my wife got in the car, a wedding song played on the radio. Well, they decided to uh, relocate from Washington out to Tennessee and uh, start a new life. And they gave away everything they had, loaded up both their cars with their children, just a few personal belongings, and went to Tennessee. He said, we didn't even have a place to live, so we stayed with my brother. I quit working for that roofing company because as soon as I got there, they wanted me to go to New Jersey for three months, and I didn't want to leave my wife again. I took a lower-paying job working with my brother, and the Lord led us to Temple Baptist Church. And while there, I rose my, raised my hand during a, an altar call. I was a sinner on my way to hell. I needed a personal relationship with Jesus and asked him into my heart. I felt this overwhelming euphoria, that hole that I'd felt throughout the trials of my life was suddenly gone. I'd never felt more complete. I was no longer a sinner condemned to hell. I'd been redeemed by the saving blood of Jesus Christ and on my way to an eternity with God. My wife and I jumped into service. We became willing to be used for his glory and we taught Sunday school classes, prayed together, and now we strive to raise our children in a godly home. We aren't perfect, we fail, but we try to honor God with the way we live our lives. Thank you, Lord, he says, for saving me. Would you bow your heads, please? Good news, my friends, is that God is still redeeming people like us. He died on the cross that we might have eternal life. And he did that because he loves us. If you're here this morning and you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity, There are folks here at the front after the service that would love to talk to you, give you some Bible verses that might help you, give you the certainty that you are on your way to heaven. And maybe you're here this morning and you know you're a follower of Christ, but the passion's not been there. Uh, The understanding that you've been forgiven hasn't really resonated with you. You're not as thankful. And that passion's lacking. Maybe you could... Take a moment now and just talk with the Lord. Allow God to take over your life. That you might demonstrate your thankfulness to him. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning thankful for the work that you have done on our behalf. Lord, you have been merciful to us. And sometimes it's a shorter road and sometimes it's a long road. But Father, we thank you for the work that you do in our lives to bring us to yourself. Thank you for the testimonies of this woman, Lord, and and even the man's testimony that I just read. Father, I thank you for the fact that you are the savior of sinners like us. Work in our hearts, I pray today. Help those who have been redeemed to be passionate and thankful. Father, help anyone here today who's not sure of their eternal destination to Be willing to come to the cross and find redemption. Work in our lives, I pray, and use us for your glory. We pray all this now in Christ's precious name. Amen. God bless you.